नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुदा So I thought uh, this uh, evening I would talk about a topic that I've talked about several times before but it's a perennial and it's going to came up in one of the uh, the live streams people asking specific questions about it and that's the nature of mind and the the, the meaning of of chitta <clears throat> in one one sense the uh, the question what is mind is kind of like the basic ultimate koan it's the it's a really big question what is what is mind it's um so uh, immediate and essential to our existence that we we take it for granted we don't always uh, appreciate what an amazing thing it is just to be conscious to be aware to have an experience it's, um it's the actual uh, nature of our being this is knowing <clears throat> and it's uh, i've often made the the point that <clears throat> it's Uh, difficult to understand the nature of mind not because it's so complicated but because it's so ultimately simple you know there's nothing there, there's nothing that we can grasp with the intellect really to put a um, to, to put it into categories or uh, explain it um <clears throat> in uh, in terms of modern uh, modern philosophy there's a whole branch of modern philosophy called philosophy of mind <clears throat> that that and they there are different writers on the subject take you know different positions and stake them out trying to explain particularly the, what's called the mind body problem what's the relationship between mind and body <clears throat> and uh it it remains elusive there the materialist bias in in uh, a lot of modernism uh would like to be able to reduce mind <clears throat> to a, a process per, uh, of the body in um but uh no one's ever been able to do that and uh, um it's the one kind of uh process of the mind that the consciousness or being aware is the one process of mind that um uh, neurology neuroscience can as the hardest time explaining they can't really grasp with it and um <clears throat> i did see in um in the very interesting book that uh uh was actually was recommended to me by Ajahn Sona the um master and the emissary about the functioning of the brain is a very recent book you know recent like in the last 10 years with a lot of um emphasis on the left brain right brain uh differences and the way they function together in the introduction to that book the the author says that um uh he he's not going to take he's deliberately not taking any stand on the the mind body problem and it's probably actually in, insoluble but um i don't know if it, that those exact words he used but he was basically saying you know, that you know we can't really explain consciousness through the brain and um that that, that doesn't matter you know it's it's something uh and in reality it's something else altogether that consciousness or mind in its pure essence is not is not the body not produced by the body and i think the uh 
the strongest argument in favor of that position is the non-algorithmic nature of, of consciousness. If anything is uh, uh, produced by a physical process, which would include a computer program or um, uh, the firing of neurons or clogs and wheels and a piece of clockwork, any kind of physical process, you have to be able to, uh, by its nature, you have to be able to reduce it to an algorithm, at least in theory. You know, an algorithm is a mathematical concept of uh, a step-by-step, stepwise um, procedure. Like, like uh, you can think of um, computer coding. You know, it's uh, um, <clears throat> you know, built up of. Uh, uh, very small, discrete steps. But consciousness doesn't seem to be like that at all. No one can even begin to suggest a possible algorithm for consciousness because it just is, it just happens. You're just aware. Awareness has no real algorithm. Much of the other processes of mind that what um, the Abhidhamma would call Chitasaka, um, thinking and emoting and visualizing and, and uh, operation of the sense organs, they, much of that can be reduced to algorithms and has been in terms of um, computer uh, operations that, that mimic human, uh, human mental uh, functioning. Uh, for example, um, facial recognition software. You know, they they be able to deduce algorithms for breaking a face up into pixels and then you know, giving numerical values to different colors and so on, and pattern matching. And <clears throat> that gets uh, uh, that gets into very sophisticated processing. So you can imagine the possibility of having a camera wired into a computer and then an output that, that puts out the name of the person. And you have, say, the police are looking at um, video from a crime scene and they, uh, they're looking for the suspect. And then they get the name for the suspect comes out of the output of the computer. But the... So that's very much like a human being recognizing a face. But the difference is the computer doesn't know that it's doing that. There's no, it has no experience. It, it's not aware. It's just running an algorithm. Whereas we're running a similar algorithm when we recognize a face, but we're also aware of the end result. We have a feeling, you know, a, a sensation of being present, that uh, we're conscious. It's the uh, difference between a sentient being and an inanimate object. That step in the process is, is absolutely immediate and it's constant. We're, we're, we're constantly, constantly conscious. And we take it for, for granted so much we don't even realize that uh, what a miraculous thing it is to... to to have a mind, to have consciousness. Uh, and it's, um, it's a practice that um, is uh, emphasized in some branches of the Thai forest tradition of uh, being aware that you're aware. Finding your true home, which is Ajahn Mahabhu's phrase, being with the, the chitta, the knowing mind, uh, centering yourself in the knowing, uh, being aware that you're aware. Now, this is really the uh, essential meaning of, of mindfulness, which is uh, sati. Uh, sati is remembering to be present. So you're conscious that you're conscious. You, know, you don't you don't forget yourself in the um, 
in the process. There, there's an awareness there. Now, the particular question that came up this week relates to the definition of chitta. Chitta is a term that's used in Abhidhamma for one of the, uh, the four irreducible categories that all reality, according to Abhidhamma, is uh, divided into four categories that are uh, each has its own uh, characteristics, it follows its own laws, and they're not reduced to reducible to each other. You know, they, they each have a, uh, their own independent function. And uh, those are rupa, which is physical matter, um, or in the case of a human being, the body. Uh, chitta, which is the knowing mind. Chittasaka, which is all the other aspects of mind, which are considered objective relative to the chitta, which is ultimately subjective. <clears throat> and uh, the fourth is nibbana the unconditioned, which is outside everything else. <clears throat> so there's a, and then there is, there is, um, or there are passages in Abhidhamma uh, describing in detail the momentary functioning of chitta. The, and uh, chitta follows the, the same kind of pattern as other aspects of reality in that it's a, a momentary occurrence. There's a there's a, a moment of chitta that takes an object, and the objects are called dhammas. Chitta takes an object in each moment. Chitta arises, takes the object, and passes away. And this is analyzed in different ways. There's different uh, levels of chitta relative to the... Um, <clears throat> The plane of a consciousness, whether it's sense desire consciousness or jhana consciousness or formless consciousness or nibbanic consciousness, there's those four. There's also the ethical qualities of whether it's skillful or unskillful and uh, so forth. And they analyze altogether 89 different types of chitta. And they also, and Abhidhamma, they also analyze chitta in terms of sequences. When we cognize an object, the mind goes through a, a series of specialized chittas that uh, process the object. And it takes 14 mind moments to be fully cognizant of, a, of an object, or 16 in, in some cases, to be fully cognizant of the object. So the, um, the analysis gets very complex uh, and uh, very involved, you know, and that's the whole, that's really one of the core studies of Abhidhamma is uh, analyzing the, the different, different types of chitta and the different types of chittasaka and how they relate to each other. So we have that on one side, that, and uh, in the suttas, the word chitta doesn't occur very often. It's very rarely used. It's more often um, consciousness is referred to as vijnana. And vijnana is used in the suttas in very specific contexts. There's the six sense vijnanas, eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, uh, body, and mind. Um, and there's a vijnana in the dependent origination, which follows the sequence because of uh, ignorance, mental formations, because of mental formations, uh, vijnana, and that's uh, explained right in the in the uh, in the text as being what's called patisandi vijnana, which means rebirth linking consciousness. And the third context in which vijnana is used is in the, the analysis of the five khandas, five aggregates that compose a human being, uh, which are uh, body, 
feelings, perception, uh, mental formations, and vijnana. Uh, <clears throat> Chitta in the suttas is used rarely and mostly in compounds, as part of a compound, uh, meaning mental or mind. <clears throat> So this has uh, uh, led some uh, commentators like um, uh, Anyana Panaka in his uh, Buddhist dictionary. He says that Vijnana and Chitta are synonyms. Um, others disagree that they're exactly synonyms. They're certainly closely related. Uh, it seems to me a, a reasonable... Uh, relation between the two words is that chitta is the abstract principle of consciousness or knowing and vijnana is how it actually functions in the whole assembly of body mind <laughs> it works through our experience of uh, consciousnesses through the senses which includes the mind sense but the principle of chitta is behind that is underneath that and we don't we can't really in experience we can't really separate it from the rest of the package it all happens together <clears throat> now the controversy that comes up and this is related to the question that i got this week is uh relating uh that scriptural understanding of chitta with the way it's, it's used in the thai forest tradition which is quite different and is considered by um, uh, by many more kind of orthodox, uh, scripturally based uh, branches of Buddhism as being heretical. Uh, for example, the um, Buddhist Publication Society of uh, Sri Lanka won't publish Ajahn Mahabua's books because they say it's unorthodox, it's a wrong view. Uh, the Thai forest tradition talks about chitta in a more, um, uh, in, in, a, in a sense of being the, the, the core of, of the being and the essential aspect of being is, is chitta. And uh, a big part of the practice is centering yourself in the chitta. And when you do that, when you're centered in the chitta, there is a, uh, this clear and unobstructed knowing and you're not uh, really troubled by anything because the chitta knows experience it knows pain and pleasure and it knows happiness and sadness and fear and, and joy as objects it's not itself ever fearful or happy or in pain or or you know pleasurable it's it knows those things as objects so there's this clear knowing this clear knowing is in is uh, in a sense transcends all that other stuff it just is as it is it's all it does it has that one function of of knowing of experiencing and it's not affected by anything. So in that way, it can neither be purified nor defiled. This is it's essentially as it is. I would like to venture that the, um, that this uh, controversy, which for some people find it very, uh, very troubling or uh, difficult to reconcile i think it it's a uh, in some ways a false dichotomy and it comes from making the error of uh, seeing uh, chitta as something and this is very difficult to get uh, to get away from thinking in those terms because of the uh, nature of our our uh, conceptualization and the nature of our language. Uh, whether you're using English 
consciousness or you're using Pali Chitta, you're using a noun. And that sets up a expectation in the mind that you're referring to something that can be found and pointed out. But there isn't really there isn't really any such thing as a chitta or consciousness. What there is is a process of knowing. Uh, it's a kind of a shorthand of convenience to refer to it with a noun. So there is cognizing, but there's no consciousness as such. There's no thing there. There's just this this uh, void process, empty process of knowing, which is really the most fundamental thing in the world in terms of ascending beings. This is our experience. This is the world that we know is built up from citta and perception. And every living being is kind of a universe unto themselves. <clears throat> Every little insect in the forest is a, is a, a point of, of awareness, of perception, of knowing in its own in its own level, in its own limited scope. And the world these other beings live in can be quite different from ours because their sense organs are different, and their level of consciousness is different. Their perception is different, so. In terms of phenomenological or subjective reality, they're living in a quite different world. So when you get away from reifying consciousness, you don't think of it as a thing, but as a process. There's then that a lot of that the difference between the Abhidhamma approach and the Thai forest approach fades away. Because there's just knowing, it's just that's that's all that's happening, and, and uh, we can analyze it as it occurs moment by moment, as Abhidhamma does, or we can just look at it from another angle, from another viewpoint, as a principle, as a as a concept of of, of the abstract concept of knowing. <clears throat> A lot of the Thai masters <clears throat> were rather dismissive of Abhidhamma. Um, I know there's a, one of the lines from Ajahn Chah, somebody asked him, how much Abhidhamma sh do you study? He said, I get all the Abhidhamma I need right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Touching his chest. <clears throat> it's another kind of little uh, side point there related to that is that um, the tr traditional <coughs> idea of uh, the relationship between body and mind in pre-modern times, at least in the East, was that it was centered in the heart. <coughs> and um, nobody had really any concept of what the brain did. I find it very uh, amusing in a way that the passage in the Sudhi Maga uh, in the section on the 32 parts of the body, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it goes into great detail about the, the shape and functioning of the different organs. And it's, it, it's obvious that the, um, the compiler of that text had no idea what the brain did because the brain is described as a species of marrow found in the center of the skull and when a person gets sick as with a cold or flu it drips out of their nose <laughs> now in regarding the relationship of brain and mind as we now we now know that there is some relationship there is to imagine that the brain produces mind. In a sense, it's, it's probably truer to take it the other way around. <clears throat> you know, somehow the, um, 
the firing of the different neurons and the patterns going on is some is somehow uh, patterned and decided. You know what what does that? You know, how does that how does that happen? And and as I mentioned previously, no one can explain the fact of awareness uh, through brain functioning. Um, <clears throat> Often when, uh, when people are trying to understand uh, the functioning of the brain relationship to mind, they fall back on uh, analogy to a computer. And I think that's a, that's a wrong analogy to use. I mean, it, it does work in some limited capacity. But a computer cannot, no, no amount of computing power can, or subtlety of uh, programming could produce conscious awareness. I think the better analogy for, if we're going to use a technological analogy for brain and mind, I think a, a radio receiver is a better analogy. The, the, the um, brain is, that, is the, like the interface between mind and body. The mind fires the neurons to uh, work the eyes and the limbs and so on. Obviously, when we, uh, the body and mind do have a, a relationship, and it works both ways, it's trivial to say, you know, the, the mind actually works the body in a sense because you, know, you, you can decide to lift your arm or uh, close your eyes, open your eyes. And, you decide that in your mind before you move the body. But the body also affects the mind. You know, if you're tired, you can't think as well. You're not as keen and aware. And obviously things like alcohol or drugs you know, uh, affect the body and then directly and then the mind indirectly. So there's some relationship there. I think of a, a parable of, um, let's say that uh, uh, there's some uh, Stone Age people living on an island in, in the Pacific someplace, and, car and there's like the cargo cultists, you know, you know the cargo cults are the, when there, there were these like, Stone Age people living in the islands in the Pacific, and the first time they were contacted by the outside world was during World War II, when the Americans started using those islands for air bases and things and the, the americans came with all this you know wonderful like candy bars and cigarettes and, and when when they when they left the uh the natives wanted to bring these wonderful things back so they uh they they built uh airplanes out of wicker and sticks and put them out in the field and thought you know that would bring the the amazing things from the sky again yeah oh. and they were called cargo cultists they made a cult out of the western technology so you imagine if some of these guys found a, a radio you kind know, of washed up in a carton or something and you know they turn it on and it's amazing it's it's got voices and music and uh, what's going on here and the, the wise men of the village try to explain it and they say well there's some little guys inside the box that are doing this you know? so then they, they take the box apart to try and figure it out and it sees no well it's just like wires and diodes and things but but then they still trying to say that that somehow that's producing all these wonderful effects and they can even prove it because if you fiddle with one of the diodes you change the, the you change the tone of the the the, the music coming from the radio so you know obviously you can you can poke at it and make it do different things. So it's got to be produced in the box. And the idea that it's picking up waves from somewhere else that <clears throat> are being broadcast far away doesn't occur to them. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the brain works really essentially like that as, as a... Uh, a uh, kind of receiver for mind.
there there have been you know, dem- experimentally demonstrated um, that there there can be direct mind to mind transmission. You know, telepathy. That's the, the various experiments that have been done show that the telepathic effect is well well beyond what uh, would be expected by chance. <clears throat> So there's, you know, there's something going on there that's not within the uh, purview of mechanistic uh, explanations. It's also <clears throat> also uh, occurred to me that if we uh, acknowledge the idea of mind as uh, its own kind of independent process. It could close a lot of gaps in scientific understanding. Um, I can think of a few examples. One is the uh, the breaking of the symmetry at, at after the Big Bang. In a purely mechanistic uh, universe, after the matter comes streaming out from the Big Bang, it should have just dispersed uh, evenly, and there should never have been any formation of stars and planets and galaxies. It should just be a universal soup of dispersed particles. But somehow in the very early process, the symmetry was broken and things clumped. <clears throat> now, the, the Buddhist uh, cosmology holds that uh, each new universe that comes into being is formed by the karma of the beings that expired in the dying universe. And karma is a mental uh, quality. So that that uh, the process of mind has a creative effect in a sense right at the very beginning then in the evolution of uh, of organisms, the very the very first appearance of living organisms is is not explained. No one can explain the the difficulty of um, the complexity of a of a, uh, a living cell. How can that? How, how did that come about? There's been some really good books written on this topic, usually from uh, the point of view of the author is to try and promote intelligent design, which is a, a creation by a you know, greater intelligence. But I, I also see a flaw in that uh, intelligent design hypothesis, because um, you know if God, which is what it amounts to, if God created life, why did he go through all these slow stages and why were there so many dead ends like dinosaurs and trilobites? And, you know, why didn't he just, you know, get to the finished product right instantly? There seems to be, in the history of life, there seems to be this kind of stumbling towards uh, greater, greater awareness, greater complexity. <clears throat> And there's there's numerous places where the um, the explanation that's it's called Darwinism or neo Darwinism fails. The idea of uh, natural selection through random mutation. One of them is like I said, the first instance of life arising. Another one is what's called the Cambrian explosion, uh, which uh, the evolutionary biologists admit it's a great mystery. How did this happen? You have uh, uh, life had been existent on the planet for hundreds of millions of years, just as very simple, like worm-like creatures with a few cells, and then uh, all of a sudden, in a, in a sh- short space of time, geologically, you get radically different body types springing up, and you have eighty different phyla of life. 
suddenly arising in the in the fossil record and you know how did this happen and there's no clear like intermediate stages it's just all of a sudden you've got annelids and, and arachnids and vertebrates you know all these things uh, <clears throat> I think a, a possible way to see that is mind is behind all all of the life, and it's not like it's intelligent and from the outside and, and creating it, but it's sort of struggling to express itself all the time more perfectly, and it's it, it so it. Uh, as a tendency towards more complex forms that allow for greater awareness, greater consciousness. Even the fact of uh, human beings, the level of intelligence of human beings is difficult to explain in purely mechanistic terms. Because people don't appreciate it on a superficial view. They don't appreciate what an expensive biological uh, uh, organ the brain is that consumes a great deal of your body's energy and it makes childbirth very much more difficult for the female of the species having babies with these big heads relative to other animals so it's much more difficult and more dangerous and the babies have to be to make it work at all the babies have to be born immature relative to other animals like a deer comes out from its mother and it just starts walking right away um, so it's a very biologically expensive, so it's hard to see in terms of natural selection how it got to be so big. You would have thought it would reach a point where the organisms could, the proto-humans could reliably catch rabbits for dinner. You know, that would be enough smarts that they need. You know, they don't need, for purely biological terms, they don't need to be able to create beautiful cave art and develop philosophies and folk tales and you know, that doesn't help them to survive. So that's all kind of you know very highly theoretical. But the the point the the point that um, you know I'm behind all of this is is to try and shake up the um, the materialist or mechanistic way of thinking that's dominated our our civilization for so long, uh, and uh, to to uh, try and appreciate the uh, the nature of mind, the nature of consciousness or awareness. In its own, for its own sake, in its own, uh, its own value. And that really is the essence of, of the practice in, in the Ma, Ajahn Maha uh, Bua, going back to Ajahn Mun, that whole lineage is uh, to be aware of uh, and center yourself in the conscious knowing mind. Uh, the chitta. Ajahn Man, as very few of his uh, actual words survive, but there's one long poem that he wrote, which is kind of a lyrical, uh, lyrical ode about the chitta. You know how wonderful is the chitta. There's a, a sutta about the, um, the nature of uh, the enlightened mind. I think I'll close with this, uh, this example, just something to, more to think about. The, um, uh, the Buddha is talking about um, uh, the conscious mind and how it takes an object and, and uh, how the uh, liberated mind, the mind of, uh, of, uh, of Arahant is... Uh, beyond conceptualization and he says that uh, think of the mind as like a sunbeam coming through a window into a house 
and it strikes the far wall. It comes in the west window and it strikes the east wall. You can see that the sunbeam on the wall. But if you knock down the wall, where does the sunbeam land? So. <laughs> Sadhu, 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 animo nam.